Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Numbers chapters 27 and 28. And chapter 27 begins with these first 11 verses on the daughters of Zelephahad. And they pose a great question and request to Moses and Eleazar, who of course are acting on behalf of the Lord. Eleazar now in the role of high priest after his father Aaron died in chapter 20. And of course, this question is also, as we read, posed to all the leaders and the congregation of Israel right at the doorway to the tabernacle. So it's a very public request that's being made. And this request in verses 3 through 4 is essentially to not be punished for their father's sin. Notice that they clarify that their father Zelephahad did not die in Korah's rebellion, but they still say he died in his own sin, verse 3. And this would have been that sin of unbelief, unbelief being the key word for the book of Numbers, if you remember, part of the whole congregation saying, no, we can't go into the land of Canaan after the 10 of 12 spies gave a terrible report of the land. They all stopped trusting the Lord other than Joshua and Caleb at that point. So they're admitting our father sinned and he died in the wilderness because of his sin, but could we still have an inheritance? Should we really be punished for our father? And the Lord completely agrees with their request in verses 7 through 11. He agrees with these daughters. And he uses this occasion to actually set up some important rules for how inheritances were to work in Israel once they took the land of Canaan. And remember, the land was vital to the Mosaic Covenant, and it's still an aspect of the Abrahamic Covenant that has not come into full everlasting possession by Israel yet. So the Lord's going to end up giving certain parts of the land to each tribe as we get into the promised land in the book of Joshua, but we're going to see it apportioned uh, on the coming chapters and the rest of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And because they're going to each get these parts of land, it's important for them to understand how to pass down that land and other possessions when there was no clear successor. So the Lord uses this as a teaching moment for the whole people. And then we get into a few verses, 12 through 14 of chapter 27, where we see that Moses is quickly nearing the end of his life on earth, a very long life, 120 is the age that he died at. Um, the first generation is nearing its end after 40 years of wilderness wanderings. And when we say generation, uh, we typically in, in, in our uh, society today think of a generation as maybe around 40 years worth of people possibly, uh, but really a generation, it, it's gotten even less now when you got generation X and generation Y and generation Z and millennials and zoomers and all sorts of things like that. Well, uh, what we want to remember is when we say first generation, we're actually talking about everybody 20 and up in Israel other than Joshua and Caleb and Moses reaching 120. You've got a hundred year span of people that are part of that first generation that die in the wilderness because of their sin against the Lord. Once again, Moses and Aaron are reaping. Aaron, of course, already died, already did reap what he sowed, but Moses reaping what he sowed when they disobeyed the Lord at Meribah. And God reminds them of this. In chapter 27, verses 15 through 23, Joshua is actually selected by the Lord in verse 18 to replace Moses as the leader of Israel. And it's quite the commissioning service. You've got the entire congregation of Israel, two million or so people, observing as Moses lays hands on Joshua to commission him. And then we move into chapter 28, and chapter 28, of course, very vital for the people of Israel. We've gone over this content before a few different times um, regarding sacrificial offerings and the rules that go into them. But uh, So we're not going to go into detail on this today, but remember the first generation of Israel. Again, everybody 20 and up, except for Caleb and Joshua, at the time of the spies going into the land of Canaan and them rejecting the Lord's plan to go in at that time. They had all received this instruction before, but now it's their uh, children in some cases, in other cases, grandchildren, in other cases, great-grandchildren that need to hear it so that they will know how to obey the Lord in the promised land. And it is gracious of the Lord to repeat it for them, just as it is gracious for him to repeat any of his word for any of us to help us understand his will better, to help us understand him better, his character, his actions. And we do learn quite a bit of his character from these two chapters, right? We're reminded that God is holy. Sin against him, he says, is treating him as unholy, which is completely against his character. Both in Isaiah 6, 3, you see the angels in the, in the uh, throne room of God witnessed by Isaiah in his vision. And they say, holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then you fast forward to Revelation 5, 8, and in John's vision of heaven, we, we see those four creatures, those angels, describe God as holy, 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 is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. God is holy and God is just. He punishes the wicked for their own sins, not punishing their children or children's children or any other descendants for the sins of their ancestors. And just as God agreed that, no, the daughters of Zelophehad should not be punished for the sins of their father, we see this clearly in Ezekiel 18.20. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. Cut and dry. In fact, there had been a a growing uh, lack of understanding as to this by the time that you see Jesus walking the earth. In John 9, 1 through 3, they pass by a blind man. A man blind from birth, his disciples actually ask him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Right? What a question that would be. And Jesus actually answers, uh, neither, right? God is sovereign. He made this man blind. Neither this man sinned nor his parents in the case of bringing about blindness. He's not saying that either of them are lack of sinners, but rather that none of their sins caused this man to be blind. It was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. That is the sovereignty of God at work. But it's also a correction on their misinterpretation of Scripture, thinking that the sins of the Father would be then held uh, accountable or punishable on the Son. And at the same time, sin does have consequences. The Lord does not judge children for the sins of their fathers, but he certainly does allow the consequences of sin to play out. In Exodus 34, 6-7, we see this. The Lord God, Yahweh, passes by in front of of Moses, proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation generations. And those are two separate ideas. The guilty are unpunished. He will not leave them unpunished. They have to be punished by him. And he will visit or allow the consequences of the iniquity of fathers to go down on their following generations. We also see at the tail end of chapter 27 in the book of Numbers that biblically qualified godly servant leadership is necessary for God's people. It's necessary in the Old Testament. It's necessary in the New Covenant in the church age as well. Look at just chapter 27, verses 16 through 17. Look how Moses puts it. He, he, he asks God to appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in before them, who will lead them out and bring them in so that, here's the reason, the congregation of the Lord will not be like sheep which have no shepherd. At the same time, it's important as we apply biblical leadership that we would we would heed what Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.22 to be very cautious about putting men in a position of biblical leadership in the church. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. In the day and age we are today, God's not the one who's telling us who he's going to appoint like he told Moses. And so a lot of wisdom A lot of discernment has to be necessary in examining a man's life before putting him in such a position. Some further application that we get, I mean, we just need to remember the gospel, don't we? We need to recognize our sin, and I encourage you to do that. Recognize your sin. Confess that you've sinned against the one and only holy God and recognize that God is just. No one other than you will be punished for your sins unless, of course, You repent and trust in Jesus Christ's perfect life and sacrificial death on the cross in your place as the payment for your sins. And if you have, then as a Christian, you and I must daily recognize our sin and daily repent, turning to the Lord who alone provides not only salvation, justification in the first place, but also the power to be sanctified, turned more and more into the likeness of Christ. And this is what we call the put off and put on principle. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, you did not learn Christ in this way, in a, in a sinful manner, to be going on in our sins. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, put off 
and that you'd be renewed in the spirit of your mind, be renewed by the scriptures as we think about them, not just read them, but think and meditate on God's word and then apply them. Put on the new self, verse 24 says, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. How gracious of God to give us his word, give us his plan for salvation, his plan for sanctification, and of course his promise of glorification for those who have trusted in Jesus Christ alone. Well, this has been Numbers chapters 27 and 28, and I hope you have a great day.